So as businesses and organizations continue to digitize their workloads, making their services accessible through the internet for their customers, for their employees, for the community, there is an ever increasing need to be able to save that this data from the growing cyber attacks. And these cyber attacks are not just growing in volume or in quantity, but they're also growing in sophistication in their attack techniques. So this is now becoming critical for businesses or organizations to be able to apply a cybersecurity architecture to protect their IT assets. So in today's tutorial, I will be sharing with you one, which is a cybersecurity framework that we can use to place security controls into your IT architecture. And we'll do that in two ways. The first way is to give you an analogy, an introduction to these different phases within the cybersecurity framework. And then after that, we apply that to your IT architecture. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. Now, the first concept I want to introduce to you is the cybersecurity framework from National Institute of Standards and Technology. And this is a particularly useful framework because they put it into phases. And the first phase, as you can see here, is what we call as identify. And identify is a very important phase. And it's about knowing what and where are your IT assets. So if you think of the analogy of your home or your house that you can see here on the left, you would have your assets. So your assets could be your cash, it could be your valuables, it could be your jewelries, it could be your TV, your mobile devices, your cell phone. All these are valuables that you would have in your house and you want to be able to identify them. So if you see on the right, you have here like your databases that can be storing all these valuables. So they could be storing personal information, business information, financial information, proprietary data and, and all of that. So you must be able to identify where are your valuable data, where are your crown jewels. You also need to identify where are the compute that you have or the servers that you have. So in this case, we have numerous servers, one for internal employees and the other one for customers. So at the same time, for employees, you are also thinking about how many laptops or mobile devices or tablets you have issued to these users so that you're better able to think about later on in the subsequent phases, what protection mechanisms you can introduce to better protect these assets that you have. So the first phase is about identifying all of these assets that you have that needs to be protected, detected, responded, and recovered later on. Now that we've identified our assets, we can go to the next phase called protect. And protect is important because we want to know what are the assets that we own and what security controls can we introduce to safeguard it. Say for example, on the left, you would have your valuables and you would possibly purchase something like a vault or a safe box that you can keep all this valuables. So perhaps your passport, your cash, your jewelries, you will place them right in here and only the people who has the pin code or the key can open the vault to access the valuables. Additionally, you could be setting up like a high wall and this high wall would also help and serve as a protection mechanism, ensuring that if a burglar tries to get over into your house, it will make it significantly more difficult for them. So for example, if your best friend forever, Mr. Hacker Loy, and of course in today's case, you'll be playing the role of Mr. Burglar Loy, and he possibly before this, perhaps you only have a low fence and he was able to jump through it. But now you have a high wall it makes it significantly more difficult for him to jump through the wall to gain access to the vault. And now your vault, which has an additional security control, in that case, he would have to not only jump over the high wall, he also needs to break open the vault. And this is what we call as defense in depth. Now in the world of IT architectural, what can we do to introduce protection mechanisms or controls? So you can think of one, you would have, for example, right at the employee. So only people who has the password will be able to access the laptop. And for your customers, they likewise need to log in with their credentials. 
they possibly have some kind of challenge like a authentication or we call that off n and authorization called off z so you'd be saying hey mr hacker Lloyd, what's the difference between authentication and authorization so the difference is authentication is proving who you say you are so if i walk up to you and tell you i'm mr hacker Lloyd, the first thing you would say is how do i know well, possibly because I got a password, I got a pin code that is saved somewhere on your backend database. And as a result of that, if I do a cross check as you're logging in, it means that you're able to prove who you say you are. Now, the second concept or word that I'm sharing with you, terminology called authorization means, now that I've proven who I am, am I allowed to do this? Can I view my profile information? Probably yes. Can I view someone else's profile information? The answer is probably no. So I'm not authorized to do that. So authorization means that now I've checked and I've confirmed and verified who I am. Am I allowed to do those things? Okay, so this is a protection control that we can put in place. Furthermore, additional access controls can be put in place. So we call them as access controls. So who can access into this specific servers? Do you say, for example, you need some kind of certificate, you need some kind of verification in order to gain access into those services? So in a situation, you could be a customer, and if you're trying to access an employee system, you probably have no access to that because only an internal employee can access those systems. So you want to have this kind of access control management in place to protect and safeguard the accesses to all these different service, services as well as data. Now moving on to the next phase is called the tech. So now that we have our security controls in place, we want to be able to detect when there are intruders when there are bad guys, hackers, who are trying to gain access to our house or our systems. So in this situation, what we have here is possibly, more simply on the left, what we typically do will be the installation of something like a camera, a CCTV camera that can help us pick up. Okay, if Mr. Hacker Lloyd tried to jump over to the wall, we're able to detect it. And we can say, hey, there's an intruder coming to our house. Okay, so of course, in the world of IT architectural, there is something that we call as the security operation center that is powered by security monitoring system. So in this case, if you see over here, what I have would be a security monitoring system, like a shield, all right? And then we are looking at all these different types of activities that are occurring, and we take that, we call them logs. So these logs are sending information from the database over into the security monitoring system. And you have your servers that are also sending all this information to the security monitoring system. And you would have your other systems, all of them sending information over into your security monitoring system, including the machines that have been provisioned to your users. So for example, in this case, for end users with something like an antivirus or a next generation antivirus called endpoint detection and response. So those things can be installed inside the employee's machine to do threat detection. Maybe the employee downloaded some malicious file, some malicious attachments, we can detect it, and we'll be able to highlight that into a security monitoring system. And of course, behind the scene, in the security monitoring system, you would have someone over there, which we call as a security analyst, that will be looking at all these different type of events that are occurring. So he'll be saying, okay, is there a phishing attack against our employees? Is there a unauthorized access to the database? And with that, once we're able to introduce the ability to detect threats, that is when it brings us over into the subsequent phases. Now the next phase is fascinating because it's all about responding to the attack. So for example, on the left, you can see the analogy here. We have Mr. Bergaloy who has jumped over into your house, over your high wall. So he's here now and your CCTV camera managed to detect it. So to pick it up through a motion sensor or some kind of mechanism to detect that there is a person 
loitering around in your garden or in your backyard, we're able to detect it and the response could be that it will sound an alarm. It will be able to automatically call the neighborhood police to come and take a look at this bad person and be able to then take action on it. Or it may automatically lock up the doors in your home. So in the IT architecture on the right, what we're doing here is say, for example, we're able to detect that perhaps someone sent a malicious file to your employee through a phishing attack. And the employee clicked onto it, we were able to detect it. And the response would be to have the EDR block out the attachment before it gets executed inside the machine. So at the same time, if it is an intrusion towards the corporate systems, maybe in this case, you have the customer. So initially you thought it's the customer, but actually it is Mr. Hacker Loy in disguise. He managed to obtain the customer's username and password and gain access into the system through the web server and after which he was trying to use this access to go over into the database. In that case, we're detecting it from the analyst here and we get an alert and the alerts say, hey, someone is doing a scan on our services. Someone is doing a SQL injection attack or any type of attack techniques. And we pick it up through the detection mechanism and now we respond to it by say blocking out the access for this user and then resetting a user authentication or having even step up challenges like having a multi-factor authentication in place to confirm that you are who you say you are. Maybe you only got the credentials, but not yet the device which has the one-time password. So these are the kind of response that you can do as part of being able to contain the attack. And this brings us over into the final phase of recover. So recover means, okay, say Mr. Hackaloy got into your system and he is an expert at ransomware and he was able to say take down some of your servers. So he was able to take down maybe this server that is facing the customers. He was able to remove data from the database and it becomes inaccessible. So as a result of that, a question is what can we do to recover? So something that I haven't shared with you yet is that there could be a backup. So you have some kind of backup in place. So this backup has already been copying all of this production information over into a separate database over here, perhaps an hourly or maybe daily. And the server likewise is also copying its data into a separate server. So when the systems are down, we're able to start booting it up. All right, so your database is up and your web server is up and your users can continue to access into the services. So you're able to recover from it because you got backup, you got a good restoration process in place to ensure they're able to recover from different types of security events. So what I really recommend that you do as a next step is to identify all of the ITSs that you have in your environment. Think about all the laptops, tablets, systems that you have. So there are IT asset management services available that you can use to identify these assets. And once you identify them, you want to set security controls or protection on this IT assets. So how can you ensure that only the right people have access to your workloads, only the right people have access to those services, and then to introduce detection mechanisms like antivirus, security monitoring systems, to be able to detect threats that are occurring within your IT infrastructure, and then be able to have incident response playbooks. So if an incident occur, do you have the investigation process or documentation to be able to help you respond quicker to those type of security incidents? And finally, to back up your critical resources and workloads and also to test the restoration process. So in a situation, if a security event was to occur, you have already tested the recovery process and can get your systems up and running quickly despite the attempts or the attack efforts by the bad actors. So with that, I hope you have learned something useful, something valuable, and stay tuned for the next cybersecurity tutorial coming your way.